Hey folks, just about to start lecture time for week five. Just gonna grab my stuff. I'm gonna give it another few minutes, but I just wanted to ask, I suppose, put out there, uh, just putting a call out here for questions early. If you have a point about code you would like to discuss today, ask me if I can't think of an answer. Make sure I got my cool demo working. Well, hello everybody. How are you all doing out there in internet land? Welcome to week five. I'm just gonna start 
the uh, <laughs> start our chat in a minute, but I just wanted to make sure that we were live. Everything should be working. Got all my computers and stuff up here. I know there's, you know, a, there's a bunch of you watching actually. That's great. Wonderful to have you here live with us. Um, I think last week my stream was a little bit weird. I'm not quite sure why it was so weird, but um, there was something going wrong with my camera or my computer or my encoders or something like that. And this week, I'm hoping that it's not. So I'm just going to listen to it for a minute, see if the voice is synced. I think last week... Yeah, it's working better this week. I don't know what the deal was with it last week. It was all like chunky and jagged, slow frame rate, and my voice wasn't matched with the video. I'm really confused about why that happened, but, you know, what are you going to do? Computers, eh? So I'll just turn off audience view here so I know it's working, but I don't have to <laughs> worry about the, the uh, stream being terrible again. Um, all righty. Folks, we've made it to, to week five, which is wonderful. Um, I think that there are some folks out there who are starting to feel like things in this course are moving very fast. That's what I've, I've heard a few people telling me that. And what I want to say to everybody today, the main thing I want to say to everybody today is that you are all doing a great job. The answer to that is that yes, this course does move fast. But on the plus, the other side of it is that we are almost done introducing new code concepts. So right now, you have learned most of the fundamental principles of programming, actually. Some of the really fundamental principles. You've learned about functions. You've learned about control flow and the flow of a program. You've learned about control structures like if then else. And you've learned about looping structures to control the flow, like while and for. And last week, we started to learn about how we could control uh, data and take care of data in our programs with arrays. And today, we're going to kind of combine a few of these concepts together into a, a, a more interesting way of containing data and actions together. Actions are things, functions, I guess, or the commands we use to do stuff package up some data and some commands together into a thing that we call an object in, in programming. Objects is the topic of this week. And the good news is that objects is actually, I suppose, the, the last new thing that you will learn about programming. And that's not bad. It's just that it's one of those fundamental concepts which you, you need to handle, you need to start using them. And we've now handled it in this week and you don't have to go back to it again. We spend the rest of this code lectures in this semester working on applying these code concepts in different ways and packing in your knowledge uh, now that you've got the fundamentals under your belt. So I guess we've spent five weeks introducing you to the vocabulary and then we spend the next seven weeks plus the mid-semester break, so that's the next nine weeks, actually training you, giving you chances to practice, giving you new examples, giving you lots and lots of ways of making sure that that vocabulary sinks in, that you really understand it, and that it doesn't just sort of float away. So I, in fact, when people say, I don't understand loops very well, I, I say to them, well, no, I, I get that. I know you don't. That's because you've only had two weeks to think about it and you may not have tried to use it in one of your own pro programs yet. So you will have many more weeks to practice to apply these skills, two more assignments and one major project um, to, to try out all of these different code skills, as well as to let the artistic theory skills that you've been learning with Tony sink in as well and bring them in and have chances to combine them in different ways and really work on getting these things to hand work together. Oh, my screen almost went to a uh, screensaver there, which would have potentially been bad. Okay, so 
now that I've, I've had that little word of, of encouragement and I, I hope that you heard it and I hope that it spoke to you. If you're someone who's feeling like you're being a bit left behind, that was a message for you. Um, you you're supposed to be left behind in some way or you're not supposed to feel that you know everything yet. Admin corner. The first assignment um, is the marking is well underway. I'm very, very impressed with the creativity and commitment that everyone showed um, in getting their first assignment done on the deadline, worked out online, handled GitLab, and had really wonderful creative um, submissions that really pushed our boundaries in what we understand a name tag to be. Great work. The uh, Don't let those uh, creative juices flow away anywhere because you need to start working on assignment two. It's out and it's something you should be starting on right now. Um, the deadline for assignment two is the first Monday of the mid-semester break. So it's the not the coming Monday, but the Monday after that. So you have less than two weeks now to finish this assignment. That's fine. Sim similarly to assignment one, it's not a huge assignment. It doesn't take that much time. But of course, if you spend some time on it, have a little break, come back, iterate on an idea, you're going to have a much better result. So I would encourage you to start now. I will start sending the pestering emails soon. Um, there's a few of you who like to do assignments at the last minute and you will find that I send you many messages on the discourse forum saying, oh, it looks like you haven't started the assignment yet. Um, the way that that works is that we have a script in our, um, our assignment system where I can tell when everybody in the class has, first of all, forked the assignment from GitLab, and second of all, actually made a start and committed something into that fork, your own personal fork. <laughs> so you know, I know this sounds a little bit like Orwellian, right? Teachers making sure that everyone's done the assignment and checking up on you, but um, we do it out of love because um, we want to just make sure that no one gets left behind in this course. So I start to send messages saying, oh, looks like you haven't forked yet. Why don't you go and fork assignment two? Then looks like you haven't committed anything yet. Um, little reminders. Of course, you know, your, your life is your own. You may choose to hand, do the assignment in exactly the amount of time it will take you. Maybe it takes 49 minutes. So you started at um, 11 past eight on the, uh, <laughs> the day that it's due. I wouldn't recommend doing that. That's why I keep sending these messages. Uh, and it also reminds a few people who maybe it turns out they've got a, a medical issue or something has come up um, that was unforeseeable and is serious and it means that they need an extension for the assignment. If you are in that situation, get in touch early um, so that we can help make sure that you get an extension, that you get the time you need uh, to do this assignment. And this also goes for anyone who has an educational access plan. Um, we offer all the support we can to anyone who needs, uh, needs some adjustments to their assessments in order to be included in this course. Um, I'm very happy to do that, so make sure you get in touch. Um, unfortunately, the way that educational access plans usually work is that unless you ask me something, I don't know what to do. So I'll try to get in touch with everyone who has that situation and make sure that we're um, meeting your needs meetings, uh, making reasonable adjustments as we go. Now the last little bit of admin is about a course survey. So your wonderful course reps, Benedict and Jarvis, who I think are in the chat right now. So um, thanks for being here, folks. Um, actually, I'm just going to send a message to everyone at channel, if anyone's not listening yet. Lecture is on now. Come and join us. Um, our wonderful course reps, Benedict and Jarvis, have put together a short course survey. I'm just going to show you what it looks like right now. It has some very simple uh, questions, just asking whether you're in the undergraduate or master's version of this course. Uh, oops, I, I haven't quite uh, updated it yet, so I'll just post that in the... Yes. Oops, I'll just post that... Um, link in here. Here's the um, let me 
Did someone else post it? Uh, could you post the link? Okay, Benedict will handle it. He's there in the, the chat. Okay, a very few um, questions here just to work out which course you're enrolled in. Talking about the quality of the lectures. Oh, I'm really hoping for excellent. I'm doing my best um, to make some really cool lectures, but your honest feedback is really useful. How you'd rate overall quality of the labs and the tasks in the labs, and how you'd rate the overall quality of the visual diary and assignment material um, so far. Then we have a few open questions here about things that you think are doing, going well, things that are going poorly, and any other feedback. So it's quite a simple survey. If you've got any ideas, complaints, praise about the course, please tell us in this survey. Um, of course, we always like to hear that we're doing a good job. So if you think we're doing well, or you think there's something you really like, then mention it. Because if you like something and you tell us that, then we might make it so that the rest of the course has more of that thing. Similarly, we want to make our courses good for the students. We want the courses to work for everybody. So if there's something you don't like, something that you are not handling well, and something that we could improve, tell us that as well. Um, I'm talking with the, the course reps regularly about different things, and I'm meeting with the tutors every week, and we think really hard about the best way to present this course content to you online so that it makes sense to everyone and so that everyone can learn together. So your feedback, both positive and negative, is really, really, really important. So that's all I'll say on that. Thanks very much. Do the, the survey right now. I see that Jarvis has just posted it in the chat. So that is awesome. A little note about assignment one. I was really, really pleased to see uh, the name tag thread show up on Discourse and people sharing their name tags uh, and having a chat. Boy, there are some beautiful, beautiful name tags there. Um, you know, when you submit an assignment, it goes to our test server and it's kind of out there on the, on the web, at least in obfuscated form. And we also have a little site that you can go and check out everyone's name tags if you want to, that just provides the kind of collates all of these, these links from the test server. So there's some wonderful, wonderful name tags here. Um, really, really cool to see everyone's creativity. So go and check those out if you like. Uh, I'm really impressed with what people have done. Okay. A little recap for a few minutes. Recap of what we did last week and the, the previous two weeks. There were two important code concepts we did recently. One was called functions and one was called arrays. Again, these are the vocabulary words you need to start embedding in your brain if you're new to coding. What's a function? It's kind of a command that you're sending to your computer, do something. But what it is when you make one is a way of packaging up a bunch of operations together. So a bunch of lines of code can get neatly put into a little block of code, we call it a block, and that makes a function. So you can repeat that, that bunch of operations. What about an array? Well, similarly to a function, it's also about packaging something up. It's about packaging up a bunch of values or a bunch of data <laughs> um, so that you don't have to have individual variables for all of your different things. Now, as we saw last week, the, the arrays idea is super duper useful if you want to have 1000 of a thing. <laughs> so if you want to have 10 of a thing, we can of course have 10 variables independently. But if we want to have a thousand of that thing, then we're going to run out of names or it's going to be somewhat hard to uh, think of enough names to cover all of those thousand things. And then your file, your sketch.js file will be really, really long because it'll have 1000 lines in it, one name setting up a variable for each kind of thing. And I can see when I've been looking at the code of some of the name tags, I can see people wanting to do complex stuff, complex stuff where they've got many objects, many kinds of shapes on their screen and they want to take care of all of those shapes and they end up with um, maybe copying and pasting the same line of code with a really small difference like a hundred times to get exactly the shape they want. So with functions and arrays, we give you tools to help you stop copying and pasting in your code so that you can concentrate on 
uh, making code which is short and understandable and still have the artistic dream that you, you've created. Oh, I should post the, the name tag link in a minute. I might think of that. I'm just going to make sure I get my... I, my um, set myself to available. Maybe that will mean I get notifications when people post. So what's a function look like? Well, this was just a syntax recap. We start with the word function. Then we have the name of the function. In this case, it's draw i. And then some parameters, a list of parameters in the, the um, regular parentheses, x, y, and i size. And this is going to be a cool function. This will package up some lines of code for drawing an eye. First, we draw the whites of the eye like this with this ellipse, and then we draw the pupil with this ellipse, black pupil on a white background. So that's pretty cool. Another thing with functions you can do is do some calculations or some operations and then give something back to whoever called that function. We call it calling when you go over to a function in your code. So if you've got some code which is trying to um, calculate something hard or make a decision or something, you might package some operations for that hard calculation into a function to do it. We might um, give a bit of an example of that in the code at the end of today. So in this case, we've got a function called bigger than four, which takes in a value, one parameter comes in, that value, and then it's going to return a Boolean value calculated by value greater than four. So if value, the input value is greater than four, this will return true. And if it is not greater than four, if it's less than four, it will return false. Our second idea, arrays, we were looking at how we can package multiple values together. So we did a lot of things like this last week where I had a array of different x values and then I would initialize it by adding in all of these different numbers there. That was pretty fun. And you might remember I was doing that with the little bugs, right? I had a big array for all of the x values of the bugs, a big array for all of the y values of the bugs, and then a big array for all the brightness values of the bugs. Now when we would get stuff out of our arrays, then um, we would use this index notation to actually access those values. So the indexing, we would put some square brackets around a number and that would allow us to access each of the elements of an array. And you might remember that our arrays start with index zero. So if we get x values zero, we're actually talking about five. If we get x values one, we're talking about 15. x values two, we're talking about 55. So this little square brackets notation is really important. That's the index of something. And then we can update our values in an array like so. We can say x value 2, index 2, equals 544. And you remember this equals sign is the one single equals means we're setting a value, um, not comparing it like you might use an equals in maths. And then we had these little commands, push to put something on the end of an array, pop to remove it from the end of an array, unshift it to put it on the front of the array, which is just mind-blowingly weird why it's called unshift, but whatever. And then shift to push it off the end of an array so that it can, uh, it can be removed. Here's our little summary of those values. Add to the front, unshift, add to the back, push, remove from the front, shift, and remove from the back is pop. So now we've done this little recap of, of things. And I guess it's time now at this point of the lecture, story time, I guess, or analogy time with Charles to start to think about our next code concept. So I guess what I want to think about today is how we name things and how we 
name and refer to the properties of things that we have under our control or that we have in our life. So I suppose by way of analogy, we could say that when you have a pet, suppose you have a dog or a cat or a lizard or a snake or a spider, you've got your pet and you know everything about that pet, right? You know its name, you know how many legs it's got, hopefully it has the normal amount, but sometimes it's less than. You know the color of its fur or its skin, you know some little details about it, how it wags its tail, how it bears its fangs if it's a snake, um, you know, the, the temperature at which it likes its food, and there's all these properties that you kind of have in the top level of your brain, right? And if you were writing a bit of code about your pet iguana, for instance, then you might have all of those variables as global variables in your code, which is great. So you have all of these things about your, your pet as global variables, and you might be able to refer to it in your program, like you might have a function for heating up the food. You would say heat up food, and then in brackets, the value of the, the temperature of the food should be temperature at which my pet likes it. So you've got all these global variables that you can then use in your functions for getting around your everyday life. Um, you might be able to get out toy in brackets, that could be a function, Fido's favorite. So you've already got as a global variable in the top level of your mind, um, a variable containing Fido's favorite toy. Now, I suppose many of us wonder, right? It's a kind of a philosophical question. It's really nice to have this relationship with a pet and know all everything about them. But what happens if you had 10 pets, right? Would you still have all of their, their bits of information right there in the top of your mind as global variables? Um, and I, I know, you know, um, people who are farmers have a really strong relationship with their animals. Um, but they have a different relationship than we might have with a pet when you've just got one animal compared to having a flock of 30 animals, you've got a different kind of relationship and you can still love them and still enjoy them and still know that they have their favorite pets. They've got different personalities, um, their favorite toys, I mean, or their favorite activities. They've got different personalities. They've got different uh, physical characteristics, but they might not be at the top of your mind. And in fact, sometimes you might have to have this certain pet in front of you to be able to remember, oh, this is the, uh, you know, the amoeba which enjoys being on the right side of the Petri dish rather than the left side. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes a fact about an animal is something which you have in your brain, and sometimes it's something which is attached to the animal out in the world. And when you're dealing with coding up that kind of environment. Sometimes you want to have things as global variables in your mind, top level bits of information. And sometimes you might want to package some bits of information up together and put them with the thing that they belong to. So they might all go together in your code. And that kind of works with an array, right? But that doesn't, it's not always quite Right, because an array, you have to refer to things by index. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just refer to things by name? And that's what we're going to do in uh, today. We're going to refer to these bits of data by their name. So if you had 1,000 uh, iguanas and each one had a different temperature that it preferred its food, you could say iguana A um, dot favorite temperature and it would get give you back that temperature. So each of your iguanas would have all of their attributes or properties kind of attached to them. And that's what we're going to do with objects today. So enough, enough story time. I think I've gone a bit long in my story, but that's okay. We've got time now to discuss objects. So what, what is an object? Well, it's a piece of code theory to start with. I think that's something we can all agree on. I'll make myself small again. Sorry, I was too huge for a while. And it's in, in programming, an object is something which has properties. It's got information about it. So that's, you might use that information to describe it to someone who's never seen it before. So if you've got your pet iguana 
you might say, well, this iguana is green and this iguana likes its food to be at 26 degrees Celsius and this iguana prefers to sit on the left-hand log and not the right-hand log. So it's got three facts about it and they might be attached to that object to describe it. So within programming, objects can be seen as a way to package up bits of information um, that I guess are different. We can also package up actions in, into them. So not only can an object related to our iguana have information about it, but it can also do things. It can have functions attached to it, which is really cool, as we will see. So let's look at a few examples, right? You often need multiple examples, multiple attributes to fully describe a thing, multiple pieces of information. If you've got a student, you might have their name, their university ID, and their uni courses that they are taking. If you have a, an address, I suppose, you could have a few attributes that go into making that address complete. The name of the street, the street number, perhaps the unit number if you're in an apartment, the postcode, the state, the country, the planet, the universe, right, etc. And if you've got a pet, as we said before, you might have name, species, breed, owner, more attributes. Now, just as in these situations, JavaScript and many other programming languages has a concept called an object, which can encapsulate bits of data together that are needed to fully describe something. And it's much easier when we keep that information together than if we have them spread apart in lots of different variables, particularly spread apart in lots of global variables, which are gonna really clutter up your code. So we don't want cluttered variables that you don't need to have separate. A few definitions. There's two definitions which are important, I think. One is the normal everyday definition. An object is something mental or physical towards which thought, feeling, or action is directed. So that's a kind of um, a definition of objects as to what you do with them in the real world. And then we have this other definition, a data structure in object-oriented programming that can contain functions as well as data variables and other data structures. Now that is a very important definition here because it's the programmer centric definition and that's the real the one I want you to think of. An object is a data structure um, for containing data variables and other data structures as well as functions. So here's what we're going to do today. Our, our object demo is going to involve making a Pokemon. So we, we talked a little bit about Pokemon before um, when we were talking about types of things but now we're going to talk about Pokemon with regard to functions. So, here's some properties that Pokemon have. Um, if we were in a live audience, I'd ask you to call them out. Things like species, level, hit points, owner, captured, right? A few, few different things. Um, and we can make these in, in P5. So, I might do it over here in setup. I hope everyone can see me. Um, just yell out if there's something you can't see on the screen, yell out on the chat, and I will do my best to get it. Now, we're gonna name our Pokemon something. We're gonna name it Sally to start with. <laughs> oh yes, Towny has said attack and defense. There are a few extras, aren't there? Now, whenever we make an object in, in P5, in JavaScript, we need to use these curly brackets as for a block. I know that's a bit confusing because we use curly brackets for functions as well and, and for if then else, but that's how we're gonna be, that's how you do it in JavaScript. So the species of this Pokemon is going to be Pikachu. Okay, first attribute. The level of this Pokemon is going to be 26. The hit points, HP, Health points, I guess you could also say, will be, let's say, 100. The owner, well, I suppose I caught it, or we could say Ash Ketchum caught it. Is that how you spell it? Ash Ketchum. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, if that's not, not Ash's uh, Pikachu. We didn't really ever find out that Pikachu had any more of a name than Pikachu, but I guess it could be, could be Sally. <laughs> Um, I know I've just from Tao, Tao suggested attack defense, so maybe we'll give it an attack 
oops, that one can be, you know, 56, and defense can be 67, or maybe it's not, not very good defender if it was like a stone type or something. And this one's captured, that can be a boolean. Okay, so we've got our Pokemon all set up. Oh, type. Does anyone know the type of... the type of Pikachu? Electric. Someone tell me the type. What's Pikachu's type? I thought it was normal and electric. We could have a type as multiple things, so our type could actually be an array. Just electric? Okay. I won't make a type an array then, I'll just make it electric. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. So now we've got my, uh, my Pokemon organized. And I'm not really doing anything with it right yet, but... I hope this is work. I think it's working. True. Lowercase true, yeah, that's it. Whoops, I made it a Python true with a capital T. Okay, so I've got my Pokemon Sally, and now I I want to actually just see that it's all worked. So I've set up an object, Sally, with all of these different properties. And now I'm gonna just gonna find out what it looks like. Print Sally. And it's just printed it out in the um, JavaScript console here. Whoops. So if you haven't yet had a chance to use the JavaScript console, I really in encourage you to give it a go. Um, if you're in Firefox, you'll type Control Shift K to get it. Um, if you're in a uh, in a <laughs> type Mustang. If you are in uh, on a Mac, it might be Command Shift K. If you're on a Windows computer or Linux computer and using Firefox, it will be Control Shift K. If you're on a different browser, there will be a JavaScript console as well, but I just can't remember off the top of my head what the, the uh, key combination is to get it open. And we really only talk about Firefox in this course, Firefox being a really interesting and important open source browser. So now we've got all of the details about um, Pikachu. You can see that a few comments right now, first of all, like the order of these is different. Here was the order I put them here. And the concept of an object, you've got all of these different properties, but they don't really have an order. So Firefox has just printed them out in alphabetical order by their key, which is kind of cool. So this is our Pokemon Sally. The first thing we might want to do with Sally is access one of these properties to find out what they are. So suppose we wanted to know what Sally's attack was. Now you remember we used these square brackets for arrays last week, right? And I'm here to tell you today that these also work for objects. So you can use square brackets and get one of your properties. And it's handy that VS Code has kind of highlighted it there. It just highlights things that are the same, which is nice for us. So I'm just gonna print that out. There we go, 56. I haven't really played around with the print command Let's look at attack. I'm just gonna type in some text. Does this work? Yeah, it does, cool. Um, sometimes when you learn a few programming languages, you can work your way into a new one just by guessing and then correcting yourself when you're wrong or looking at the, the reference um, documentation. So my guess was that if I had multiple things in a print command separated by commas, it would print them out separated by spaces, which happened to be true. So here's the attack of Sally. Sally attack is 56. That comes out on the JavaScript console. There's another way to get that value. Print Sally dot attack. 
this is really, really important. This is kind of a faster and more intuitive way to access properties from a, an object. And it's the one that you'll see most common, sally.attack. So we should have had 56 and then another 56. Something went wrong there. Is that right? Oh yeah, we still got our 56, cool. So maybe we'd like to see if Sally was in a battle against themselves, would Sally win or not? And we maybe we could can't we could figure out if Sally's going to win by working out um, Sally's attack minus Sally's defense, right? If Sally was going to like electric tail herself in the face, <laughs> then there. Uh, we might detect their, whether they win or not. So we'll see what Sally's attack minus Sally's defense are. So that would give us, oops, this number, 19. 56 minus 37 is 19. We can start to use this. I know I'm going off, <laughs> I'm going off, uh, off piste a little bit now, but, um, <laughs> We could, for instance, say if sally.attack minus sally.defense is greater than zero, then we are going to print sally was defeated, else print sally was not defeated. This is kind of a silly battle against yourself, but I'm just trying to make a point that we can now use these properties in one of our control flow examples. So Sally was defeated because Sally's attack was stronger than Sally's defense. So there was a, uh, the uh, attack was successful. It, it got through and took away some HP. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that. I might go back to my slides for a minute to remember where I was. <laughs> I think I've gone through a few slides now. We've got our JavaScript object, Sally the Pokemon. We've got the name of our properties, some text that comes before it, HP is an example, and then the value of the properties comes after the colon. Then if we want to have more than one property, we've got to have a little comma after each one. Species Pikachu, comma, level one, comma, HP 100, comma, owner Ash, comma, captured true. Uh, Benedict just asked a really good question. I'm gonna show how to do that, how to do that at the end. <laughs> we can certainly make an array of objects, which is exactly where I'm getting to, but I really wanna get, get this clear about how to use objects first before we put them into a cool array because we want to know, I want everyone to feel comfortable playing with these things. And your play with your tools is the most important way for you to learn how to use them, right? I've just been playing with objects and Pokemon names. I haven't, it doesn't look like I've done anything serious, but I kind of have. I've learned about how to use some of these properties. I'm gonna show you a few more things. Now, this is something that comes up in this course. I know that there are, there are folks out there who are finding some of the terminology we use in computing confusing, and it can be. It can sound like jargon, and it can sound strange that I'll use one weird word and not another. But we, it's just like any other field. We have terms um, that are called out as being important in computer science and they end up sort of embedded in the tools we use, the meaning the programming languages. So even though in everyday language, we've got a lot of interchangeable terms, property, attribute, characteristic, trait, aspect, um, we can sometimes choose just one of them to be the most important one in a programming language to mean this specific thing about objects. And in JavaScript, it happens to be that we chose the term property to be um, the one that we use about an object to mean it's, it's uh, important pieces of data which are attached to it. 
So just be careful. Um, if you say that a property has a trait or an aspect or a type, you might be talking about something else. But in uh, the objects we're doing, they have properties. Okay, we've talked a little bit about syntax. Um, as you know so far, sometimes there can be many ways of doing the same thing in JavaScript, lots of different ideas. But for objects, we are always going to be using the squiggly braces. And you can see in this example that the, the spaces around the braces don't matter. In, in fact, even the line breaks don't matter. It's just the squiggly braces, the colon, and the lack or presence of commas. So we're going to look at a few other things you can do with, with objects. I guess um, you know, here's an exercise for the reader, for the viewer. Take some of the things we were talking about earlier, cars, humans, uh, addresses, and turn them into objects. It can be a really useful exercise. What can we do with objects? We're going to get values, we're going to set and update values, and we're going to add new values, maybe. So that's where we start to get, uh, get serious with our objects. I told you about how to get values, either using dot notation or square brackets notation. I'm probably always going to use dot notation for objects. Um, just because it's a little bit easier. It has, you save three characters, right? One, two, three, four characters needed there. We only need one character. That's really nice, just to save us a bit of typing. Oops. And now, <laughs> the question is, are there any times that dot syntax doesn't work? And as it turns out, when you have an object, you can give it a property which is where the name is not a string. It might actually be a numeric, uh, a number. Sorry, not a numeric, a number, which is a JavaScript type. And the, um, if that happens, you can use it with the square brackets notation, very similarly, suspiciously similarly to the way we use the uh, array indices actually, but we can't use the dot notation. Um, I guess there's some crazy JavaScript reason for that. Um, I think I told you a few weeks ago, I'm learning JavaScript as we go. JavaScript is one of the languages that I kind of avoided my whole life and, and now I'm teaching it. So I'm really happy to be learning about it, but I sometimes don't understand the reason, the history behind why certain decisions were made. Now, how about setting the value of a property? This is where we can do an example with our, um, our, right, our Pikachu. Get rid of that for the moment. So, so far we've got Sally the Pikachu. Print um, Sally is a Sally.species. So we've got a Sally is a Pikachu going on there. And now suppose Sally has had this battle and Sally has actually evolved. <laughs> OMG, Sally is evolving. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we do is we take Sally's properties and we change them because when a Pokemon evolves, all of its properties change at once. So first of all, Sally's species is going to become Raichu, which is the evolution of Pikachu, obviously. Then we know that Sally's HP, Sally.HP, is going to equal something bigger. But I guess because it's evolving, some of its properties might rely on the previous property. So Sally's HP might be five times Sally's previous HP. And it's a bit confusing now because we've got Sally's HP on both sides of the equation here. But this is just like with arrays when we're modifying the same variable. On the right hand side we've got the old value and the left hand side we've, we're setting the new value to it. Should probably use some, um, some uh, semicolons there as you're supposed to, strictly speaking. And similarly with attack and defense. Attack equals 1.5 times sally.attack and sally.defense equals 2.2 times 
Sally dot defense. Okay. So now we've changed Sally. So we're going to say print Sally is a Sally dot species. And then we'll just print out all of Sally's attributes. How about that? All of Sally's properties. So what do we get? Let's go through our flow. First, we print out Sally is a Sally is a Pikachu. We have a battle with Sally. Then Sally evolves after the battle. OMG, Sally is evolving. Now Sally is a Raichu. And we've changed all of these attributes. So now Sally's attack is 84, not 56. Sally's defense is 81.4. Sally's HP is 500. Sally's level is 26. I should probably change the level so it's plus one or something. Oh, we should do that before, right? Because that would be what causes Sally to evolve. Sally dot level. Here's another notation for you. Plus equals one. That's a little bit of a shortcut. You can actually do that with all of these. I think you can do it with times and divide and minus. Um, you can, if you want to say that we're changing a value by a simple mathematical operation, we can use this little shortcut syntax. So this is the same as this, sally.level equals sally.level plus one. Oops. Sally.level plus equals one. I might print out Sally's, print Sally's properties here. So Sally started at level 26, got to level 27 and immediately evolved into Raichu. And then let's see, we've changed our properties so we can see what happens if Sally then, you know, punches himself in the face again. Sally.defense. I'm really not sure about my how fun this Pokemon game is going to be if you only get one Pokemon. Oh, it's still going to, still going to win, but it's closer. <laughs> So we're going to defeat itself because its attack is 84 and its defense is only 81.4. So it's so close, but it will lose again. Okay, so we've been modifying, setting data, accessing it, and then modifying it using dot notation. Updating values. Here's this little hint about minus equals I just gave you. A little bit quicker to type. Uh, very common operation. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> Pokemon equals Fight Club. That's right. Pokemon turning into Fight Club. The only rule of Pokemon Club is there is no Pokemon Club. What? Uh, it seems wild. This is the kind of thing where, which is like where you've gotten used to another programming language. You're like, wait, what? If we just want Sally to have, you know, another property, we can just talk about it and then it magically appears. So if Sally was going to have like, um, you know, sometimes Pokemon, you give them like a crystal to hold or something, crystal equals red crystal. <laughs> I'm really jumping the shark now. So I've given Sally another property called crystal, and I'm going to give it that text, red crystal. I'll see if Sally uh, successfully picked up the crystal. Now my object has, has a crystal. Oops, where it is? Crystal, red crystal. So it didn't have a crystal before. There was a Pokemon with no crystal. Oh, it's confused about it because it keeps printing the same thing, but... Um, you can just talk about a uh, this kind of. You can talk about these properties that um, our objects have, and then they suddenly have them, which is a bit confusing when you compare it to variables. Because to get a variable, you if it's a complicated name, you have to declare it. If it's just x y a b c, they're often declared for you. But if it's complicated, you have to declare it. So. You can't just use them without declaring them, but in the case of properties for objects, you kind of can. <laughs> this can get us into trouble though, because suppose 
I was talking about a variable that doesn't hasn't been set yet, doesn't exist, Sally.pants, that I'm actually going to get into trouble. It says undefined. So Sally.pants doesn't exist. So we get that um, that outcome. So we do have to make sure that our our properties have been set before we use them. Otherwise we'll just get undefined. Yeah, so we could uh -oh, sally.hat equals true, and then perhaps you could use some code in your, your properties in your code from now on. Um, if we hadn't done this, then we would end up with this undefined, as I said. Um, undefined is an actual thing, but make sure that you know what properties you want and that they're probably set before you use them. You probably don't mean to have things being undefined that often. So why should I care, right? This is the big question for this lecture because so far I haven't told you anything that you can't just do with variables. You could have just had variable attack, variable defense, variable level, variable name, variable um, uh, type, and that would be fine if we only have one Pikachu. But if you have a lot of Pikachus, I don't know what the if there's a different um, collective noun for Pikachus, a gaggle of Pikachus, a flock of Pikachus. If you've got a flock of Pikachus or a swarm of Pikachus, then it may become cumbersome to use this same terminology for them all the time. The other reason you might care about objects is that whenever you're doing stuff in P5, objects will be used under the hood all the time. So if you make a color, it turns out that that is also an object. Just get this into my code. Oop. Here's our object for magenta, this color. <laughs> An object with a whole bunch of properties. So lots of things in P5 are objects. There's lots of P5 objects. Images are objects. Vectors are objects. Um, can we have objects within objects? We totally can. We very much can. Here's an example of a car which has an object inside it of its paint. Different. Um, that could be useful if you wanted to actually draw a car to have all of the properties about its paint um, left in your, uh, in your code. So you could try that one out at home, but this is going to get you car.paint.color, you'll get to car.paint is that property, then dot color of the paint object is red. <laughs> Pika people. <laughs> Rowan's got some very, very good uh, Pikachu eye. I think I, I prefer that one. Pikachu's, Pikachu eye, Pika people. Excellent ideas. Can we use arrays in objects? I think I hinted that that was totally fine. You can certainly have an array in an object. Um, in this example, suppose we've got a hand of <laughs> Pika liters. That's a very small measure of the volume of Pikachus. If you've got all of these different properties, hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades, none of those, for your hand of poker cards, the value of this, pokerhand.clubs, you're going to go to the clubs property, which turns out to be an array, and then index 1 is, that's index 0, and this is index 1, so it'll be 6 that comes out there. Now, a question you may have right now is, how does this relate to arrays? Because arrays and objects are looking like they're pretty similar right now. In fact, you can even use that kind of square bracket notation. That's starting to look a little bit suspicious. And <laughs> under the hood also in JavaScript, arrays are objects, which is a bit weird, but that's how it is. The property names of an array are numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And then the arrays also have some special functions attached to push things on the end and pop things off the end and unshift and shift. So they're special arrays, uh, which is why they look so familiar. Which should I use? I'm writing some code. I don't know whether to use an object or an array. Well, 
when you have an object, you might have several related values that are for different kinds of things that you want to have, you want to give them a named label. And that was the case with the Pikachu. It had a uh, type, it had an attack, a defense. It would be weird to say Pikachu zero and get its type. Then you'd have to kind of remember what the index is, which index is correlated to which bit of data. It's much easier if you can represent that data by a name. And if you have a whole bunch of things that don't have names, then you can use them as an array, which is uh, use them in an array. It's an excellent, it's excellent to use both of these things at the appropriate times. So don't feel limited to either one. I'll show you how to do it in a minute with the bugs. Um, yeah, I guess, well, this is an important slide. You know, you folks are starting to be like JavaScript hackers getting your arrays and functions on, starting to dive into objects. And you might be Googling around trying to figure out how to do this stuff. And unfortunately, it's a little bit of a jungle out there on the web about JavaScript. There, JavaScript has a, a heck of a history over the last 20 years. And there's a lot of different ways of doing things. There's lots of different ways of doing objects, which I don't always understand. We've done objects in one way in this, in this lecture, and I might show you some others as we go along. But this is the, the, the most important thing to take away from this lecture are the kind of intuitive understanding of what an object is and then knowing how to get and set properties so that you can talk about it, ask good questions and get help if you're doing something that's more complicated than that. Yeah. So now for our kind of, our final little example of something cool, we kind of know now what this is. This is a point. It's got an X and it's got a Y. And now what about this one? We've got a point which has an X and then it's got a red background, which is a function. Now I think I hinted at this before that objects can have data attached to them, but they can also have functions attached to them. And that becomes something which is a little bit wacky or it's a bit hard to get your head around, but it's completely fine. This is totally fine JavaScript. This is an object which has one property, 100, and one function attached to it. And when a function is attached to an object, we give it a special name. Why do we give it a special name? I don't know. It could be called a function attached to point, but in fact, it's called a method of point. Uh, Method is the special word we use for a function when it's attached to an object in this particular way. What if the property is a function? So the value of a property can be a function in JavaScript. I'll show you an example, just as I said. Um, yeah, another name. Oh my, it's very confusing, but it will make sense when I put it in context. I'm not gonna do that example. I'll do one with the bugs. Further reading, watching. I think, I mean, I mean, I did bugs last week. I might start from scratch with a slightly different kind of um, example. So I'm gonna get rid of the Sally the Pikachu. By the way, we're now in the kind of live coding <laughs> demo time arrangement part of the, the lecture. So if you have any questions for what I've been through, pop it in the chat and I can have a chat with you about it while we're coding together. And that's usually the funnest way to do it. Okay, so I got my setup and I got my draw. And what I'm gonna do is make a function up here called blob, or sorry, a, an object called a blob. And I'm gonna give blob two properties. It's X property, <laughs> it's gonna be 300, and a Y property, which is gonna be 450. Yeah, and do remember to fill out that survey. Very, very important. And it's gonna have a size as well. Size 100. I won't give it a color right now. I might give it a brightness. That was pretty good last, last time, wasn't it? Uh, 
Okay, here's my blob. Now in my code, I might draw it. Let's make sure I'm doing nothing in draw right now. I'll do it, draw it in draw, how about that? So I'm gonna draw my blob. And in fact, I might actually make a new function that's gonna draw the blob for me, draw a blob. Whoops, that's not how you make a function, is it? Fill, and it's gonna have like, kind of a green color, because it's a blob, RGB. Uh, I have it as kind of 200 and maybe a little bit of blue, B. Okay, I'm gonna make it so there's no stroke. And it's gonna be an ellipse. And it's going to be positioned where this blob is, or this blob that's handed to it. So I've got a blob here, which is could be any old blob, but actually it's gonna be this blob, because I'm gonna call this function. I know I'm kind of doing everything at once, but that's kind of how programming is, isn't it? I wanna call the function draw blob, not draw blob, draw blob, <laughs> with this particular blob I'm looking after. b.x, b.y, b.size, B dot size. And the brightness is gonna be, it's, or it should, could be it's alpha, I suppose, but brightness will work for that. Is this gonna work? Here we go, there's my blob. Cool. <clears throat> so just take a look and, and look at what I've done here. I've made an object at the start as a, a uh, kind of global variable to contain some data. I could print some stuff out about it in setup. Print, oh, not processing instruction. Print, blob. There's my object, brightness 200, size 100, x 300, y 450. Now Shui Wang has, has asked a very good question. Why not blob x, blob y? And I could do that, I could do that. But now I wanna have blob two. <laughs> How about this one? Um, make another blob, blob two equals x, you know, 500, y, 450 or 300, a bit lower. Its brightness is gonna be, oops, 150, a bit dimmer, and the size will be a little bit bigger. So now I've got two objects, blob one and blob two, And I can draw both now, because I've taken my drawing code and put it here. I could say ellipse blob2.x blob2.y blob2.size, etc. But I'm not going to, because I've extracted that code and put it in a function called draw blob. So when I put the code in a function, draw blob is gonna draw whatever object I give to it, and that object is gonna be called b. So I'm taking blob, when it gets put into draw blob through its property there, then it gets renamed, given a new name, inside of draw blob, inside of this draw function, and the new name is gonna be b. So fill b.brightness, b.x, b.y, b.size, b.size. So now I have two blobs. <laughs> now this is where objects and functions work really well together. Because you could have a number of objects 
which all have the same properties but different values. And then you can have a function which can do something consistently with all of those values and you can apply it to each of your objects in order to draw them. So how about this? I've got a blob, two individual blobs, but maybe I'm going to make a blob array. This is where things start to get exciting. I'm going to use let actually. Forget about stupid old var. Blob array equals empty array. Okay, so far so good. And I'm going to fill my blob array with some stuff. For let i equals zero, i less than 10, make 10 blobs, i plus plus. Does that work in JavaScript? It does, 10 highs. I plus plus takes I and adds one to it. So now I'm going to make a new let temp blob equal x. I'm going to use some random numbers here because I do like to use those. x random width, y random height. Now I think we're starting to answer Benedict's question from earlier. How do we combine objects and arrays? He, seems, he can see the answer is coming up. Brightness is random 100 plus 100. So we get a number between 100 and 200. And size random 50 plus 50. So I made myself a temp blob just within this, this little block. And I'm going to add it to my array. How do I do that? I use pop. Uh, push, sorry, not pop, pop, pop. Takes things off. Temp blob. Hello. So now I'm filling my array full of blobs. I'm actually going to print my array. We can, if you're ever confused about what you're doing in P5, just print it and use the console. There's no better way just to figure out where you are in your code, what's going on with a variable, than just print it out. Okay, we've got 10 different blobs, all with different locations. I don't need to do that again. And I'm going to actually get rid of these ones because I don't need those anymore. I'm not going to use them anymore. Because now I've got an array full of blobs. This array is full of blobs. And now instead of drawing them individually, I'm going to use another for loop to draw them, which is wild, isn't it? For let i equal zero, i less than blob array dot length. Do you think, what do you think dot length is? It's a property of an array. A property of an object with a special object called an array. Uh, i plus plus then we are going to draw the blob we're talking about. Draw blob, blob array, i. Draw blob, oh, we only need to do one. Hello, we've got all my blobs being drawn. Isn't that cool? I thought I had no stroke, but it seems like they have a stroke. Oh well. Someone tell me in the chat what I'm doing wrong. I see strokes here, but I thought I was doing no stroke. What am I doing wrong? Oh, brackets. Whoops. <laughs> Thanks, Harsh. Okay, so I've got my 10 blobs, and every time I restart, they're going to be put in different random locations. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Now, 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 what should I do with my blobs? Thanks, mate, ease. We need a blob to bubble and I'm good. I don't want bubbles, I want blobs. And my blobs are kind of, kind of, 
they're going to you know do some kind of blob actions blob grow or jiggle I suppose blob jiggle I kind of want them to swell and then get smaller again so just as I was doing my I can use this this variable b again and it will only be useful within that function blobulate that's a good way to call it blob blobulate so the what I want to do is change its size so I'm going to change say b dot size oh, will this refer to the very hmm. I wonder if this will work I'm now off coding off paste in Java because I in JavaScript I haven't tried this is that a copy of that blob or is it the same one I was talking about? B dot size equals B dot size plus one. We're just going to see if everything increases. Oh, that works. Oh, cool. Okay, We're, these are blobs that only take over. Uh, <laughs> so my blobs now kind of like They're kind of wiggling, but I also want a bit of that cause action. B dot size plus cause. What were we doing last week? You folks were so great telling me what to do. Um, frame counts. Plus one. Well, they're gonna. Hmm, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. <laughs> so the problem is they never get small again. That's too fast. I want to slow things down. Divide by one hundred. Now they're just too slow. Somewhere in between. I'm going to change that to 2. Okay. Now I've got my blobs happening. One point five. <laughs> now I've got my blobs that are kind of blobulating. So I've used... What have I done? I've got an array. I've filled my array full of objects. Then I have used two functions that operate on an object to paint that object on my canvas and then blobulate that object so that they grow and shrink. Now I'm going to show you one more little trick. <laughs> one more little trick. Because I told you before that objects can contain not just data or properties, but also contain actions or functions. And a really good use of a function in an object is to do something to itself, right? So if I was a blob, maybe one of my actions could be to paint myself on the canvas. And another option could be to blobulate. So I'm going to make two functions for each of these objects. This is where things start to get really cool. Is, I'm going to have a draw blob draw function. It'll draw. Whoops. And I'm going to have a blobulate function. 
if things at this point are starting to feel a little bit cray cray, then that's okay. You can come back next time and we'll be working on these, these concepts throughout the semester. But I can now take this information, copy it from there and paste it into here. And I can take this idea, the blobulate idea and copy it from there and paste it into here. Make disco blobs. I should do disco colors instead. Now we're almost running out of space here because my program is getting actually a little bit co complicated, which also says means it's awesome. Now, what about this B? That's not going to work. If I actually write this, it, it won't do what I want because B there doesn't have a value. I want this, this function to operate on the blob that is calling it. And this is where things get a bit hairy. We've got one other term to, to use. If you're an object and you've got a function and that function is to use your properties, you can use the special word this. This blob is now going to draw itself on the canvas. This blob is getting its brightness. This blob's x, this blob's y, this blob's size, this blob's size. There's some other programming languages that call this self instead, which makes sense, right? Because I'm an object I'm calling myself, but we're never the object. We're always looking at it um, somewhere else. So this makes sense as well. This dot brightness, this dot x, this dot y, this dot size, this dot size, etc. And now I can actually get, I'm just going to comment those folks out, not use them. And I'm going to copy these two things out, don't need them. And instead of using two functions, I'm going to say blob array dot i to get that blob. And I'll just call this function, which is attached to it, blob array dot i dot blobulate. And you know, lo and behold, it does the same thing, which was exactly what I wanted. So I wasn't this, 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 this. Yeah, Java has this, Python has self. Um, some people are talking about different programming languages in the, in the chat. You know, I was saying, once you know one programming language, many others sometimes start to make more sense. So, should we do something else with a, with a, a blob? It could float, maybe. Another function. Maybe that's going to move its location a little bit. This dot x equals random minus 2, 2. This dot y equals random minus 2, 2. Oh, that's going to put them in the same area. I'm missing something. Plus equals, plus equals. That's what I want. Uh, oops. I needed a comma there. Sometimes when you see the little red squiggly line under something, it means you've got to look at the line before. Where am I up to in the, in the chat? Oh, someone else is talking to me. My tutors are talking to me. What are those up to? What are they up to there? Don't they, can't they see I'm lecturing, not, not handling marking issues right now? Um, now we're going to do blob array dot uh, i dot float. So they're kind of moving around a little bit. They're wiggling. I wish they would float a little bit more like <laughs> directedly. Maybe we'll work out a way to do that next week directed floating, because it feels like now they've just got this, this Brownian motion thing. Brownian motion meaning like random motion in any direction at the microscopic scale. They tend not to... That doesn't quite look right. I don't know. I don't like this. I don't like that at all. All right. Well, if you think of a better idea for my how my blobs are going to float, then please, um, you know, tell me in the chat. 
we're now at the end of the lecture and is float a reserved word? No, it is, it is not a reserved word when it's used as a property. Why use commas? Why use the comma? I needed the comma because, you know, a, a, a let some object equals, when I've got a, a list of the properties for an object, they have to be separated by a comma. There has to be a comma between each one. And you know, JavaScript was being pretty flexible with whether you needed semicolons within between lines or not. It's not flexible about needing commas between properties. So you have to make sure you get that right, otherwise your objects won't work. Float function. You know what we're doing now? We're doing object-oriented programming, which is pretty cool. It took us only five weeks to get to it, and you know, in some courses it'll take you the whole semester. So, oh yeah, we got green fireflies now, but they're kind of, my fireflies didn't blobulate, did they, uh, Benedict? So, <laughs> my, the, this week they have got a high level of blobulation. And there, any other questions right now? I want more blobs. See, this is where we can get things to really take off. Want a hundred blobs? We can make a hundred. That's some cool blobulation going on right now. I've put a few more links to different uh, resources you could use in the lecture. Um, this has been our little introduction to objects, but of course, you now have to use objects for many things in the in the course. I'm going to make myself big again so I can be in front of the blobs. Keep working on assignment two. Make sure you fill in the survey by Friday so that our wonderful course reps have something to talk, talk about. Um, you know that uh, we are now at kind of the end of the basic coding ideas. So we'll be packing in a few extra ideas or how to use these programming concepts more effectively, efficiently, and engagingly in your programs for the rest of the semester. Next week for the code section of the, the lecture, I'm just going to recap everything just to make sure that we're all on the same page about the terminology and the different things you can do so that everyone feels prepared for the second and third assignments. Um, so I think I'll pop us back to the outro page and I will catch you folks a little bit on Friday and then next Wednesday for week six. So see you later.